every day when I bring my children to school, I pass a dirt road. There's no reason for me to really take that road. It's bumpy and there's always the chance of getting a flat tire. But since a year or so, my son insists that we cycle along that road. It all started when his best friend at school asked him, Hey, Floris, do you dare to take the hero's road? <laughs> and since then, I have no other option than to cycle along that bumpy road. What I try to show you with this anecdote happens to us every day. New media, social media, the news, politicians, organizations, scientists, they all offer us frames that we can apply to construct reality. How does that work and what can you do with it? First, there is the dirt road. That's a fact that can easily be double-checked. But now let me introduce the actual frame. That's the archetype of the hero. That's the organizing principle that is socially shared and persistent over time. My son is using it to give meaning to the dirt road. And as such, the hero's road is socially constructed. But to what extent is that hero's road also a fact? For him it is. It's guiding his actions, his behavior. So in that way, it, it has to be reality. This example also demonstrates the difference with the popular uh, meaning of the term framing as something that results in a false, in an incorrect version of reality. But in the contrary, thanks to frames, reality takes shape. A fact and a frame results in a new reality. Do we stand in relation to the dirt road or to the hero's road? Do we run because it is real or do we run because we perceive it in a particular way? Which version of reality is guiding our behavior? Take a look at this. Some people are recognizable by their haircut. <laughs> now, let's be clear. It is you who might be making a political statement out of a simple, factual observation. Some people are recognizable by their haircut. It is your brain that making, that's making connections and comes to conclusions. Framing works through association. We see an image, we hear a word, and we immediately are making connections. It's our flexible brain that fills in the gaps. Because, of course, we all know this is Charlie Chaplin, <laughs> and that's John Bon Jovi. <laughs> now let's talk and think about asylum seekers, refugees, undocumented immigrants. One way to perceive these people is from the perspective of the victim. Seen from, from that frame, they deserve our attention and our help. But with one snap of the finger and another and another and another, that tiny victim turns into an intruder, into a villain it becomes all the more emotional. Our prisons are filled with colored people. I no longer feel at home in my own country. Our typical Western values will be jeopardized. And of course, when the intruder is in your mind, you only see intruders, and when the victim is in your mind, you only see victims. Framing works through simplification. Of course. Some of these people fall within the Convention of Geneva. And they were forced to, to flee their, to, 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 to leave their country. They, 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 they flee for persecution. They are 
are looking for a safe haven. But on the other hand, there is a stranger that can evoke fear, and, and he or she can make us to feel uncomfortable. So in the end, both frames are correct. Both frames are correct. But what happens, however, some people start to generalize and reason from the one frame or from the other. And the result is polarization. What can we do to stop that polarization? First, remember that there is always a mid position. Let's say 10 to 20% on the left, 10 to 20% on the right. What, what with the 60 to 80% in the middle? Just start and keep on asking questions. And if you find out that the definition of a situation is problematizing, then there should be some frame at play. Try to find out which frame it is. Second, a frame is only a suggestion. A suggestion, an invitation to look at an issue from a certain prism. But if it's a suggestion, well, then there should be also some alternatives. And we know that there are about 16 different frames to look at migration. Win-win, the welfare gap, uh, fear for the unknown, uh, uh, two, two roughs, a uh, uh, measure with two sizes, uh, etc. Mosaic, plenty of frames. Third, try to combine these frames. A combination of frames is the best way to demonstrate the, the, the complexity of an issue. It will result in a more nuanced picture of reality. It will make people think. It will stimulate a debate. And in, if, in the end, someone prefers the victim frame or the intruder frame, well, then at least it's the result of reflection. Fourth, if you don't like frames, try to look for counter frames. Whereas a frame results in a problematizing definition of a situation, the counterframe does do the opposite, and it results in a deep problematizing version of reality. And when the definition of a situation is changing, also the solution might change. The solution we are looking for might even become self-evident. The ideal frame knows how to connect. It brings people closer together and doesn't put them right opposite each other. A possible counter frame could be the encounter. Then we are willing to take on new experiences. And that's an invitation to all parties in all possible directions. Because contact leads to recognition of what unites us as human beings. I, I hope that my, my talk today is an invitation for you to look further than your own frames, and that you're willing to look for alternatives, and to look for connections with the ideas of others. I will try to do the same next week when I cycle with my son and daughter along the hero's road. <laughs> what I found out, what I found out is that the hero's road is actually a counterframe. It's an invitation to me. My son taught me a lesson. Look further than the tiny chance of getting a flat tire and enjoy cycling along the hero's road. And I will do that next week. Thank you. Thank you.